Okay. We're streaming okay. live on Facebook. And let me see, just get that started over here so I can see if anybody's chatting. It's muted. Okay. And we're also recording. Uh, in, well, I'm recording on my computer, and uh, that will go up to YouTube. And uh, I always post recordings uh, on my blog at learningtogether.net. And I include the text chat. So is everybody okay with that? Silence indicates okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's an opt out. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. And let's see. Well, uh, this is the 498th Learning Together episode, and uh, I'm, uh, let's see, it's, it's the 12th of November, 2020. I'm Vance Stevens. I'm in Penang, Malaysia, and I do a bit of interaction with uh, Phil Brown and uh, ITDI. So he he's going to tell you more about this, but he made a post on Facebook recently. He said uh, the, the post uh, promoted uh, Kindle Raleigh's um, eight ways to energize your classroom. And I thought, wow, this is neat. It looked really nice. And I said to Phil, why don't we, why don't you, have, you know, come on learning together with this? And he said, yeah, why not? Let's do a, let's do a collaboration together. And that's, that's what we're doing. So we, we encourage people, I, in, uh, learning together is very informal. So it's polite if, you're not talking if you mute your microphone. Uh, yeah, keep just keep the background noises out. But if you want to talk, just unmute. You're welcome to do that. We like to see webcams. And um, somebody's in the waiting room twice trying to get in, really trying to get in. Okay. So anyway, um, over to Phil, I think. All right. Thank you, Ron. So yeah, this it was great. We uh, Kendall got in touch with me and I shared his post and it then got shared over 50 times on Facebook, um, which was fantastic response. Obviously, love, drew a lot of interest in um, just off our ITDI page, which is the International Teacher Development Institute. And so hence um, the rest of the story is answers shared. And now we're really happy to be able to talk and get together with teachers uh, and have the opportunity to ask questions, uh, share ideas and experiences and help one another in our own classroom situation. So um, I'm Phil Brown, I've been teaching about 20 years, um, met Vance via online, actually we've yet to meet face to face. Um, but Same country, live yes. right down the road from each other. Indeed. And then, yeah, I work with ITDI as director on TESOLs to cook course and also for the University of Birmingham on their master programs, but still teaching as well. And today, I'd like to just pass you over to Kendall. Hi, um, my name's Kendall Rolly. I'm um, the PDQA coordinator at a school in Hanoi, Vietnam, and that's just another fancy way of saying teacher trainer. Um, I have been eight years here teaching in Hanoi and I work at a, a K-12 bilingual school so it's got its fair um, share of challenges as part of you know intercultural workplaces. Um, I've published, a, in, I've been publishing um, and then sort of moving a little bit more into presentations and conferences recently. I've had some publications in um, EFL magazine, in Mindshift which might, some people might know, um, Modern English Teacher um, I have a master's in applied linguistics. I wasn't one of Phil's students, though. Um, and I'm particularly interested in studies in, in motivation and demotivation as it relates to um, teaching English as a second or foreign language. So what I'm going to do is I think that Vance is going to set up a poll to see which of the um, eight ways to energize the classroom people are most interested in learning about and we can kind of I guess start with the the one that people want to hear about I'll just while we do that show you those eight in case you haven't had a chance to to see them before um, while I I'm doing I, I realize the irony of doing um, a workshop about educational technology I'm actually fairly new to zoom itself so please be forgiving if um, if there's any glitches here <laughs> When you're ready for the poll, just say go. 
Okay, I will just share my screen here mm -hmm. and I'm going to, okay. So can everyone see that? It's a little bit um, small, so I'll just go zoom in a bit. We had eight ways to energize the classroom. Um, the first one was uh, four corners. And some of these, of course, you might be familiar with in your own context, and that's great too. Um, four corners, uh, we have um, inside, outside, which is a way to facilitate group discussions. Jigsaw groups, uh, entry and exit tickets. Um, what is the question, otherwise known as flipping the question. Uh, chain notes here, which is a, a way of facilitating anonymous student responses. Uh, learning stations and KWHL. So we'll wait to hear the or see the results of that poll and then we can sort of go from there, I guess. Are you ready for the and poll? KWHL was for looking at uh, what we know, what we want to know, and so forth, right? And how we can find out more, yeah. Okay, here's the poll. Which of these activities are you most interested in learning about next? If we, we came to a time crunch, which ones would you really like to hear about? This will help us guide our, uh, our delivery here. And you can select more than one as you wish. Depending on your device, after you've selected them, you may need to scroll down a little bit to hit a submit button. Chain notes is in the lead. Mm. Followed by flip the question, Jeopardy. And the sushi, the revolving sushi. What's not to know about the revolving sushi? One of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Okay, chain notes is still ahead. So 13 people have responded. Looks like the responses have tapered off. Should we end it? Okay. There we go. Did, does, do you see the results? And I'll click share yep. results. Ah, here we go. Okay. So that's a bit of a surprise, but I'm happy about that because I've got some, hopefully some good ideas, but... Um, should we start it off first by asking people what, uh, let, let's first of all spend some time talking about what Chain Notes is exactly. Um, Chain Notes is, of course, um, a way to um, facilitate anonymous discussion. So we've got some other ways that we can do that in some interesting ways that we can talk about. But um, the original in-classroom version involves a large envelope, a question being written on the envelope, um, the students writing down responses <laughs> Putting it inside the envelope, the teacher then at the start of the top, at the front of the class, reads out each response and, of course, can veto anything um, inappropriate. <laughs> so let's, I'd, I'd be interested in, um, in sharing some ideas that I had about that. First of all, chain notes. Um, can we have a show of hands of people who are familiar with Padlet? program called Padlet. Okay. So a lot of people are. If you're not familiar with Padlet, Padlet is, um, in fact, I can show you. I'll show you one that I did um, earlier. This was actually done in class because Vietnam, we went online very early and we also came back to school quite early as well. Let me just share this. Okay, so you can see here some, I had a question, I was with my grade 12s, we were talking about the differences between um, English and Vietnamese pronunciation and some specific difficulties that um, speakers may have. So I, I felt that this, when I was thinking about how we could adapt chain notes for an online context, this sort of immediately came to mind as a potential um, solution. Uh, we have, of course, all of our answers here. And you, if you're not familiar with Padlet, can... Um, approve responses. You can uh, be careful of the comments. You can't approve the comments. So um, you have to be a little bit careful with that. 
Um, and you can, of course, customize this. So you can create a Padlet and then send it out to your students. Um, they, on their devices, can, can add it. So if you're teaching synchronously, it's a really good way for everyone to be able to see each other's answers at the same time. There are a limited amount of Padlets that you can have for free. But what I do is I will recycle it and rename it and clear all the things out, and then I can keep using it. Um, so what about uh, what about you, Vance and, and Phil? Do you have any ways that you um, like would like to facilitate an activity like this? Um, Mint, Mintimeter has an interesting, has three interfaces for open uh, open discussions. One of is one at a time. So if people make a comment, it comes one at a time on the screen. And another one revolves uh, three columns, I think, of comments. So if you have a lot of people, uh, they just kind of roll in and out. And then the third kind is the sort of the way it's a wall, like Padlet. Lots of tools for this kind of thing. There are, yeah, for me, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Phil. Uh, mm -hmm. So Padlet's pretty new for me. I was kind of came across it this summer, and so prior to that, I've just been using, uh, for example, whiteboard in Zoom, and then dividing it up. Uh, it was interesting listening to Catherine Billsborough yesterday or the day before talking in uh, British Council. Uh, seminar and she was talking about the importance of thinking about how much space we give each of our learners to fill in and so in terms of for example when we give them a board or blank space if it's a big space it might be intimidating for beginners so giving them a smaller space uh, makes it seem much more durable so that's something I'm going to add into my consideration for doing this type of activity. And does anyone else have anything that they'd like to share in terms of um, a way that this activity could be facilitated in the online environment? You could use Google Jamboard. Can you um, explain a little bit more what that what that is? It's a bit like putting a post-it onto a, a whiteboard. Uh, I prefer it to Padlet because I find it loads more quickly. Um, the Padlet can be a bit cumbersome and can take a long time to load. That was Google Chatboard, was that the name of it? Jamboard. Jamboard, right. Okay, that's great. Um, but I think any whiteboard, any external third-party whiteboard would work for the activity, I think. Sure. Even the internal whiteboard from Zoom. Do you? Does anybody find that the students are more or less likely to engage in discussions online than in face-to-face -face lessons. Michael, did you find that that Jamboard increased the participants or participation? Or I think it's different students participate more in the different environments. I don't think overall that there's a great difference. Right. And some prefer spoken, some prefer text. Correct. Yeah, I have a similar experience and also I notice uh, a big difference between obviously students that knew each other from in-person classes before going online, for example, compared to students who started online and building the community with them takes a lot longer. What were some ways that you were able to do that, Phil? Um, so with, with students who start um, offline. Um, actually, I haven't actually had any this year. I knew my students from January, so even if it had been a short time, it was, it was fine. Um, but from colleagues, then basically they've spent more time in, um, in doing the activities in the chat, which they find students find easier to engage in compared to video. Um, breakout rooms with pairs and small groups. And the other one actually is, is um, depending on their context, they can leave, the, they can open the room a bit early uh, online and just let people come in and, and chat and get to know some of their classmates. Uh, in some contexts, like in Japan, quite a lot of teachers, so they found that they go in and it's just dead silence or people arrive exactly on the hour on time. But leaving the classroom open after class has kind of allowed people to make some of the social connections that they miss from not having corridors to walk down together and so on.
Does anyone else have any anything that they wanted to add on um, chain notes at all? I suppose we always think in terms of the students knowing each other, but often I have the other problem. They know each other, but they don't know me. Well, yes, I, I didn't go through that personally, but we had some uh, some teachers at our school that, that were introduced first to, um, I guess, to their students while online. We had to, we had to replace a staff member um, who was going home because of COVID. So um, we, we just sort of, I guess, did the, the traditional getting to know you activities, but did them online, I guess. You know, activities like, I guess, the... Um, I'm struggling to think um, of exactly which activities he used. But if anyone's got some suggestions, um, that would be very welcome. Uh, just curious, uh, Michael, how, how do you, what do you do to compensate? Or if you feel that the students don't know you well enough, what techniques do you use to uh, rectify um, that? Well, one, a kind of inversion of the normal getting to know your activities. Do you remember a program called Mr. and Mrs.? So two people who are about to get married and you ask a question, they should know this fact about the other person. So you're inverting it so that I get to know them, but they are ask, answering questions about each other rather than about themselves. And so it's a simple gamification. So, for instance, you can ask somebody, say, uh, Mary, what is Jane's favorite hobby? Or what country would she like to visit? Well, any questions like this. And, of course, you know, they get a point if they get it right. Um, and you can extend it to have the students come up with the questions themselves. Do you get them? Do you let? Do you facilitate them getting together um, before the questions are asked to predict what questions might come up? Yeah, you give some questions. They write down an answer. They don't show it. They hide it. And then you can even use just a piece of paper. They hold up the answer. Um, should we move on to the the next highest in the poll? Yeah. Which was. Um, flipping the question, and I'm excited about that because I, it gets me a chance to introduce some of you, hopefully, to um, a wonderful new program that we've discovered. Um, before I, I keep going, I'd like to say that we actually started, um, towards the end of our online period, reducing the amount of different things we were using. We found that it was a, getting a bit bloated. Um, in terms of all the different things that we had going on. So we kind of cut it down to some key um, key core programs. Um, and I can talk about that a bit later. But um, if you're not familiar with a program called Flippity, um, let's actually, can we get some hands about if anybody's heard of Flippity before? Okay, so this is, this is going to be interesting. Uh, let me share my screen here. And I'll just talk you through it because it's a completely free um, program that we've got. And what it does is it's, if you're using Google Sheets, or in, I believe you can easily turn an Excel document into a Google Sheets, it usually, it can basically take any data that you have and do all the gamification for you. So you can do, um, for example, a quiz show, which is the one that first came to mind for um, flipping the question. Um, we go in here, we have our template, we make a copy. It's all very user-friendly. We can even see before we do it, a demonstration. So we can um, run this. I would imagine it would have to be synchronously online. Um, you can do that and you can see the teacher's view and everything like that. But you can customize in this um, spreadsheet. Obviously the internet's not going well at the moment, you can um, type this around. So you could easily, you know, for example, answer, a, you could type in your own answer to one of these and then have the question and just flip it like that. And then you can run basically a game show um, with students. And the thing I really like about Flippity is just how easy it is. You know, I'm sure you're all used to spending 
um, hours and hours, maybe just doing like a very small segment of your lesson if you're teaching online. This is going to take a lot of um, a lot of the gamification work out of it, and it's just you're really just inputting the basic information, and it's doing all the gamification for you. So it's a really good resource. I wish we'd discovered it earlier because I think it would have made our online teaching a lot easier too. So I'll. What about uh, let's any ideas for from Phil and Vance? No, it's good. I really like to see that. I remember spending hours years ago trying to make those in uh, PowerPoint. This this uh, how does how does the back end work? It you, you input. How, I mean, how does it create? Uh, I'm sure. familiar with text manipulation. Let me share. Right I think okay. it's loaded now, so I can share that with okay. you. Mm -hmm. Do that. Can you see that there? Can you see the the instructions there? Yeah. Okay. So we it you make a copy of the template. Oh, I think I've got it open here already. Yes, you got. Uh, you can enter in all your data here, and then depending on exactly which flippity. Um, resource you're using, you can basically it generates a link for you. Um, I'm not sure why there's the error message right now. I'm pretty sure that's going to be fine here. Oh, sorry, let me get back to it. <laughs> okay, so it's having a problem now, to be honest, but I haven't um, had a problem with it previously. So, of course, when you go to show people, that's when you have the problem with it, right? Um, I'll just, while we're here, show you um, another way that that you can do four corners just because it's on the same site. And then I can show you some of the back-end functionality a little bit more easily. There's the Flipperty manipulatives. So I'll show you that. I've got it here. Um, you can see here through the demonstration what it's going to end up looking like. So what we have here is you could put some different categories in the corner here and then you can have the students' names and they can drag them around, of course. It would be different if we were um, having different categories. But for example, imagine this is favourite types of social media. You could have the logo for the different types here and then people can drag their names around that. That's got to be teacher-led though in that context because it's not like a, a Google Sheet or something where everybody's seeing each other do it. The teacher still has to, to lead that process. Um, let me go back to the back end. You can customize a lot of different things here um, by backgrounds. And then basically the end thing is you have to click Publish. Just an automatic process and then it will generate a link for you here. And of course, we've got another error message. But, the, but yes, it does work. I'm just not sure why it's not working right now. But the link is what you showed us? The, yes, the link yes. is what I showed you. That was the demonstration, so you mm -hmm. can see here. This is what it eventually will look like. It's just that you can um, you can end up customizing it. And the same backend drives all these other games? It's, it's similar. It's fairly self-explanatory mm -hmm. if, you, if you go into it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it guides you through basically and they're just depending on exactly which one you want to use, you can, um, you can just make some small adjustments and have it customized to you. Hmm. Interesting. Is there anything that else that you wanted to see about that before we get some suggestions from other people? Well, all of it, but never mind. <laughs> it might be a, a discover a journey of discovery, perhaps. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's like link, kind of browse through and try some things out with. Yeah, definitely worth a play around. Our um, my our head of edutech at our school was very excited when we stumbled across this. So I know when he gets excited that we're onto something good. <laughs> um, I can put the link there just in just to make it easy in the chat as well. So I'll do that. Um, anybody else have any ideas for um, for facilitating that activity? 
I was just going to say that uh, any links that go in the chat will be put in the uh, in the wiki. In, sorry, in the in the blog post. So it's a good way to share links. If you have any contributions, please just write them in the chat, and we'll just include them in the show notes with the archive. And a couple of people have also joined on Facebook. Uh, they've been here with a hello from uh, Mubarak uh, from Morocco as well. So welcome if you're joining us there on Facebook. These are some web heads. Susan Cane Susanna Canello is there. Uh, let's see who else. Mike Contreras, who's a professor in Greece, uh, quite productive in his EFL work. Okay. Okay, back to you, Kendall. You're you, muted. You're muted, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Like I said, still getting used to it. Um, moving on to the next um, activity, which was the revolving sushi. Um, I couldn't think, to be honest, of a direct swap here um, that would uh, be the exact same function that you would get with revolving sushi. I kind of played around with some, um, if you're familiar with wheel decide, there's some other ones where you can basically get two wheels that will, that will move. Um, and I think that that was on Flippity as well. But I thought basically if we look at the general principle of that, you basically want to um, facilitate discussion and you want um, people to be able to um, chat with different people, right? So we know most of you would be familiar with the breakout rooms, whether it be in Zoom or Google Meet. So they are probably, I guess, the closest replica that you can find online to a classroom discussion. Um, in terms of thinking outside of the box and, you know, how this could be run asynchronously, um, I had some suggestions too. One thing that we found really successful was um, using either Google Docs or Google Slides, having maybe just a table in there and um, asking students to, uh, basically you can set up a table in, in Google Slides with all your students' names and then they respond to a question in there. Um, you can also get ask your students to comment on each other's work inside the Google slide and of course they can all be um, seeing each other work at the same time and it can be quite a nice experience to see everyone back in the same place all collaborating. Um, but also in terms of facilitating an asynchronous verbal discussion, so if you're doing some elements of asynchronous learning, there's also um, a program um, called Flipgrid. Is anyone familiar with that? Can we get another show of hands? Flipgrid. Yeah. So some people are familiar with Flipgrid. If you're not, I will just do a quick, just quickly show you. Um, it has its advantages and disadvantages, but overall, um, it's just it gets boring doing the same written responses every time, and sometimes you just want to be able to, I guess, facilitate um, some verbal discussion or get kids back talking verbally or students if you're not teaching young learners. Um, just hold on one moment. Okay, so with Flipgrid, basically, you set a discussion topic and students, um, you, you have your groups, you can see my groups here, you go in and you have different topics to be able, that will facilitate discussion. Um, you have different topics, you ask your students to respond, they can also respond to each other, you have quite, uh, you can either set that privately, um, or you can get them to um, be able to see each other's videos. I had a lot more success when I told my students that it was going to be private and only I would see it. But it's just a different way of, of getting them to respond to a question rather than just typing all the time. Um, you know, this, this might not work for your context if um, students are feeling insecure about their, their home life or don't want people to see um, their background as well. So it all, of course, depends on your context as well. Um, so that's just an asynchronous way to facilitate discussion that, that I came across. But I'd be interested to see if anyone had any other ideas for this um, 
maybe Vance, did you have anything that popped to mind immediately? So just to interject, um, Kendra, we were seeing the PDF. Yeah, I was Did wondering what, about which that. one you I were will, talking um, about. I, right. Okay, sorry about that. Let me see if this will work. So it wasn't just me. <laughs> is that is that still the PDF, or can you see um, flip it, Flipgrid up the top? Ah, uh, Flipgrid, yep. yes. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm very sorry about that, everyone. Uh, I'll just quickly go through what I said. You have your classes. Mm -hmm. here that you can set up. This is also free as well. Um, you can set it to archive or hidden as well. You can um, go in here and set topics for the students to respond to. I gave students feedback. Um, and you can see here that most students feel a bit uncomfortable about sharing their face. So they all just did that themselves. So they're all using emoticons to hide their faces because they're teenage learners and they you know, feel very self-conscious, of course. Um, and you can basically hide it from each other. So I ended up doing a lot more hidden because the students would tend to respond more um, if, if they knew it was only me seeing it rather than each other. Mm. But on the times, it was very strange. On the times when I didn't make it hidden, they were watching each other's videos again and again and again. It was very interesting. So I guess that's, um, that's probably what I said. So apologies for the earlier tech confusion. So I'll, I'll throw back to you, Vance, if you have any um, anything to add to that. Well, uh, that's a really nice way to get students interacting with each other and uh, kind of like uh, voice thread, a, a similar kind of program. But uh, Flipgrid seems very popular. Um, so I, I, I'm retired. Uh, so I'm not using it with students, but uh, I've been including it in some of the training that I've been giving to teachers. And Phil, did have you did anything pop into your mind for um, sort of a similar thing to inside, outside, or revolving sushi? Yeah. So just taking a little bit of a recap um, in class, uh, for example, when I used to have larger classes, used to create two two circles, right, concentric circles, and you have one student facing each other, and they will talk, for example, for three minutes, and then they will move, one circle will move around, so you, they're talking to the next partner, talk for three minutes, move around and talk for another three minutes. So it's a good fluency task, because they get to do the same task, but with a different partner, obviously, different answers. You can adjust the timings if you want to, if you want to put a little bit of pressure to perform faster, reduce the time a little bit. Uh, Paul Nation has this kind of the 432 as a common model or 543, five minutes, four minutes, three minutes. Um, with my learners in Japan, generally, I adjusted it to 120 seconds, 90 seconds, 60 seconds, for example. Um, with moving on to online, then um, I might look into setting up multiple break uh, breakout rooms so that one person will stay in a breakout room and the other people would move um, so you can number the, you can number or you can name the breakout rooms so I think it could work if I put in numbered breakout rooms so number one number two number three so it's easy if you started in number two you just go to number three next and then number four and zoom allows you to have a maximum of 50 breakout rooms but I haven't tried it with that many for sure uh, it'd be interesting to do it with um, some fellow teachers first to make sure that it works before I try and unleash it on my students. But um, that's my kind of my first thought. We could try it really any time. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I'd be really interested to see because I realize that the suggestions that we've offered aren't like an exact replica of the inside outside. They, they, they take the fundamental principles, but we're getting, you know, quite further, far away from the format. So I'd be really interested to see if anybody had or came across anything that would replicate that or just basically any tips for facilitating communication online. Yeah, I'd like to encourage people to respond either in, you could respond in Facebook. I know Mubarak Al-Qadr, for example, is uh, 
Uh, he's uh, he uses Flipgrid a lot. He's quite uh, likes it. And anybody else is welcome to take the mic and uh, respond to us. All right, well, I might move on then to, to the next one. We had just below that was learning stations, um, which is more difficult to move online. And actually, I've heard different definitions of what learning stations are. I've heard learning stations being used um, as a way to differentiate the same activity. So the stations were tables um, with different ability learners. But the way that I first got to know learning stations was, I guess, different activities set up throughout the room um, heading towards the learning goal and letting the students make choices about the way that they wanted to reach that learning objective. So that's obviously, you know, can take a lot of time to prep. And I don't think that online is any different in that respect. Um, in terms of learning stations, um, I did have some information I wanted to pass on, so I'm going to include that because it's a little bit more of a complicated, a complicated one to get into. I had some information here, but I'm not sure where it went, to be honest. <laughs> okay, um, I was just going to jump in a little bit. Um, last week, I can't remember exactly where or when, unfortunately, but I was reading a, um, a blog article written by a teacher sharing kind of one of the things that they were doing in Zoom for setting up something seemed akin to learning stations, which I quite like the look of, uh, reminded me a lot about kind of self-access center where I worked in previously. And they set up um, four breakout rooms for their students and they created kind of basically one room was like a reading room and students could go off there and they could just basically they could hang out and they could read there and if they wanted to chat to each other quite about what they're reading they could do that then they had another corner that was like a conversation chat room where basically you could just go and talk to people and then they had another room that was kind of a discussion topic and so on so i could see see this working with my university students that i had in japan um but I would, I would do this further into a term or a semester once they've already got to know each other and they kind of know and are familiar and comfortable with Zoom. Yeah, I, I found that link that I was talking about that has a pretty good and, and quite comprehensive guide to running virtual learning stations. So um, mm -hmm. I'll put that in the chat now and we'll, and events will also include it in the wiki, I'm sure. Just send that to you, Phil, only. Send it to everyone. Okay. Has anyone used a, what? What are people's general definition of learning stations? Those of you who've used them before, have they tended to be um, differentiating learning across different places in the classroom, or has it been that sort of activity stations that that I was mentioning? I was going to ask Phil what kind of activities uh, were particularly good in that uh, context. In the face-to-face. -face. Sorry, learning stations. Yeah, in the face-to-face -face situation, learning stations. Then um, we also actually we also had like a, a movie corner, and people could put on DVDs, and they could also ask. Um, ask teachers about what kind of DVDs to watch in English and uh, they would all be subtitles so you could choose whether there's subtitles in English and so on and it was quite interesting to see that how popular it was for students to kind of watch something and pick up um, some language from uh, things they were watching or talk to their friends about what they're watching um, they had other corners where we had a lot of kind of um, both games that were originally made as games in their own right, and then also games that were made as language learning games, um, like language learning conversation card games, or um, things like Junior Scrabble, and so forth. Uh, so there in a self-access learning center, it was about creating a 
a different environment that was welcoming and creating much opportunities in an EFL context for students to use English and for English to have its own life outside of the classroom. Sounds like uh, you online, you could probably have students rotate through each other's kitchens and show food preparation and things like that and discuss it. That's a really interesting, that? mm -hmm. yeah. Jeff Lebeau does a lot of that. He's, uh, he's uh, in Korea, he used to be, uh, I don't know if you, you know Jeff Lebeau, but anyway, uh, in the early, in my early days, he was, uh, we worked together quite a lot. And, um, and now he's in Korea, but he in his blended learning environments now moving into online. And, um, he has always had but cooking was just one thing that he would share because he, he does video podcasts with his students and uh, the cooking ones were really interesting. You know, as far as, I mean, anybody could, you didn't have to be a student to want to watch this. Might have to think about it. Just have my kids writing re basic recipes. They're like primary aged, but they were basically doing you know, how to cook a scrambled egg, for example. Um, let's see what they do if they were online. I told uh, the people in the Facebook chat that if they made comments, I'd pass them on. So Jane Xian in Taiwan said, uh, I would say each station would have a different focus on learning. Do you think? What would some examples of that be to, in your mind, Vance? It's in Jane's mind. I don't know, Jane, type fast and, or, or come join us. Um, I'll just add to that and say that there's, once again, on the flippity bandwagon, there's probably quite, quite a lot you could do there in terms of using the same learning objectives and allowing the learners the different ways to, to get there. You could basically have the same, potentially the same spreadsheet and just auto-generate all these games based around it and see what sounds interesting to the students. Any reply from Jane yet, Vance? <laughs> Hmm. No, don't know what she's doing there. Oh, well, anyway, at least we passed on her comments. And, and anybody else who makes comments in the, in the Facebook chat, I'm, it's kind of difficult to blend these together. You, you almost have to have three people, you know, one person presenting uh, and the, someone who's just is able to watch the text chat. Otherwise, they are separate entities in a lot of these webinars. But right now, we're able to blend them a little bit together. So if anybody has any comments there, we'll try to include them here in the uh, live webinar. There was yeah. a shift in the comments I saw um, from, uh, sorry if I put you on name, uh, Rocio or Rocio, um, saying what I did was having three sessions on meat at the same time in order to replicate those stations. For anyone who's not familiar, can you, is that Google Meet? And uh, if you're still around, then um, if you can expand on that or just kind of give us an example, that would be very helpful. Was that in the... Uh in the Zoom chat? I was looking in the yeah. Facebook chat. Oh, in the Zoom chat. Yeah. Okay. One problem with yes, and she also was talking about uh, something called Word Wall earlier that I'd be interested in hearing from her too about if she's or he is around. Yeah, Word Wall, Word Wall's been used um, with my youngest son's kindergarten, actually. Um, and it's basically it has like some online games which you can use for learning vocabulary. Um, it has things like whack-a-mole. Um, so it's good for their age. They can kind of, they're quite happy to kind of tap around the screen and find um, either sight words or things they've just been studying. It works well for their review. And, you know, it's naturally they kind of want to play it again. So 
it has a built-in practice element to it. And then with the primary age, my primary age kids, like my own kids, they've uh, had quizzes from their school, which they've really enjoyed. That's kind of been one of the newer ones. Previously, you know, Quizlet was very well known and so forth, but quizzes is much more gamified. The interface is much more kind of friendlier for young learners and teenagers and so on. So, yep. I use quiz uh, quizzes a lot and, and Quizlet and Kahoot. Um, I find that quizzes is, is in many ways better than Kahoot because it places less emphasis on being quick and more on being right. Mm. Yeah, so I believe the point system allows for that. Um, but also, one thing I did like about Kahoot more was that it, you know, that you have that everybody kind of seeing the leaderboard on the screen, but now quizzes has recently um, brought that feature in too. So it's like all the benefits of Kahoot seem to all be in, in quizzes now. So Yeah, and the really nice thing with quizzes too is being able to pull what someone else has done and you can then take it and edit it. And so there's a lot of kind of peer-to-peer -peer sharing and adaptation. So I will, for myself then, for example, I'll take things and um, pick questions that I, the existing questions I like, edit out and change other ones. Um, maybe put my own students' names into the questions and so forth, which always gives them a bit of a kick. Um, they're like, oh, that was me in there and so on. So. A Socrative is really good for that too. Uh, it's uh, you know for sharing. It's, it's got a, It's baked into the interface, and it's uh, used to use it a lot uh, among our fellow teachers. And we had it's quite easy to share. You just send a link, and uh, someone can just bring that into his or her uh, Socrative lessons and manipulate it. Um, if we are able to, there was just sort of getting down to the, the ones that only some people were interested in, but I think I've got some interesting suggestions regardless. Um, that I just wanted to quickly put through an idea about entry tickets that I had. I'd just like to show that um, that was, I think, down there on the list. But if we can see here, can everyone see the, the Google form on screen? Okay, so we've got this here. Basically, um, what you can do is set up a Google form as an entry ticket and, and see what students know previously. And though although this video is not loading, um, what you can do is set the confirmation message in settings to whatever you like. So in this case, you could set it to be the, the Zoom code for the, or the Zoom link for them to enter the class. So they can't enter the class until they've entered this, um, their answer, their prompt to this question. And then you can use that, of course, to, to kick off discussion about the topic. Oh, yep, you can see it here. It's working now. So you can go up here, you can set um, the presentation in the presentation setting, and you can see here that I've set the, a Zoom link there. And then if I enter in my own information here, you can see what the the learner would see. I should have set it to short paragraph rather than short answer. You can submit and then we get the link on the next page to enter the classroom. So that was just one idea that I had um, on entry and exit tickets. Um, anything from any ideas about entry or any thoughts on entry and exit, exit tickets, Phil and Ben? Yeah, it was interesting. It's completely new to me, um, seeing it done that way. Um, for, for a larger class of mine, then definitely I'd be interested in taking a look at playing around with those kind of ideas and options. Um, my classes at the moment are also much smaller, so it's less of an issue for me. But I think with larger numbers, definitely easy to kind of collate and see things together. Um, can you do, you can also do it so you get um, um, different types of questions, right? Like multiple choice and so on, so. Yeah, you can do it as multiple choice and, and you can set it, if you set it as a quiz rather than a survey, you can get it to self-mark as well. 
so that can save time as well and you can export the data too if you want into like your own you can then use that data to put in your own student tracking system so it's pretty handy we we, we have google apps for education at our school so it's really nice everything sort of integrates with each other making it very handy and a lot of the third party apps also integrate with with google classroom for example so it's really handy to have um, I just wanted to also talk about um, I just wanted to also talk about an idea that I had for um, doing four corners online um, and what I'll do is I'll just bring up this on the screen just bear with me I'm always interested but, with you sorry oh no sorry. that's okay I was just going to show you um, uh, a way that takes a little bit of time to set up initially but then can end up being sort of a way to not just do four corners but also to kind of um, do lots of things where students are basically dragging their their own avatars into categories and things like that um, I'm just please just bear with me I'm just having a few tech problems here no worries um, Vance has added a comment on entry tickets as well um, and shared a reference there. I always find it interesting, you know, the, the, the wide range of ways in which you can use entry tickets. Um, so for example, you might use it as uh, like with some warm-up questions for a topic that you want students to talk about to help get them thinking rather than waiting for them to come in class and start writing. When they kind of entry, they might be asking about, you know, what do you know about a certain topic? and so on, just kind of prime people. Then when they come in, they'll already be interested to know what their classmates have said. And so then it's kind of creating that fertile ground for discussion in breakout rooms. Uh, sure. if, if you want me to share a screen briefly, I could show you SOFLA, which uh, sort of syncs with, is that okay with you, uh, Kendall? Okay, I saw a nod, nod, nod. Okay, I guess I took that to be yes. Okay, so there we go. This is uh, Sofla. It's uh, this is from an article by uh, um, Lane Marshall and Ilka Kostka, and Sofla means synchronous online flipped learning approach. This chart kind of explains it in a way. I mean, it's all explained in the article, but it's a it's a way of uh, an approach to doing classes online. And as you can see, uh, well, there's pre-work that the students are supposed to prepare before they come to class, and then a sign-in activity. And when the entry ticket seems to really fit right there. And then the, your, cl your class continues with whole group application breakouts, share outs from the breakouts, and then starts uh, anticipating what's uh, going to come in the next lesson. And then there's a reflection step, and then builds into pre-work for the next lesson, et cetera. So it's a cycle. It's just an approach that uh, that I it just came to, it, it brought to mind the uh, the entry ticket just stop bang signing activity it's really good sorry let me unshare there's a link to the article in the text chat um, if I may I do have a, a quick I'd like to quickly show you this video of the way to set up. Uh, something like Four Corners, but I think there's actually more applications than that. So let me just share this here now. Okay. So we can see here, what I'm doing is I'm actually working in Microsoft um, Paint, uh, Microsoft Paint to start with. And you can see here, I'm going to actually set up student names here. Um, you only have to do this once and then you can reuse them. So I'm imagining a very small class just for illustration purposes of two students only. Um, and I can do them in different colors. So just bear with me while this goes. And then I'm going to just use this um, selection tool and I'm going to drag them across to Google Slides. And I've set this up, what's your favorite type of social media? I can basically put it, or you could even, you don't have to use student names, you could get them to select an avatar that represents them. Um, and what you can do is basically get them to drag themselves across the screen. Um, because once you share this, 
you can basically, um, they can all be on this same document, of course, at the same time. So that's a really straight replica of Four Corners, basically, um, that I thought of and that I've used before, and it's worked very well. Um, let me just um, share my screen here. Yeah, there's just one more idea. Just a quick backup. What is Four Corners? I'm trying to remember myself. Sure. So in the classroom, you would ask a question and students would physically move into the corner of the room that best represents their answer to the question. It could be a, um, it could be a binary one or it could be a, a, an opinion-based question. So in the example you saw, it was an opinion-based, what's your favorite type of social media? You'd randomly choose one of the students that's gone into, let's say, the Instagram corner and use that to, to probe and ask further questions and get them to justify their opinions. Um, so you could do that basically in a similar way. Um, you could even have an additional slide where students had to say why. But it gives them that basically the replica of, of being in the classroom and being able to, to move and see others moving around. Yeah, so it's like uh, breakout rooms in Zoom. You set up four breakout rooms. It's four corners. And uh, people could go to the different corners. Is that what you mean? Yeah, OK. Don't forget you're muted. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, so um, I would be interested to see if anybody has any other ways that, that they've done that. I would just add with that example that I showed you, basically make as little of the background manipulable, manipulatable as possible. Um, for example, that's why I would use pictures of the students' names and avatars rather than the text box in slide because it can get really messy with students like clicking in and um, starting to edit text accidentally. So you want to basically, uh, the ideal would be only that part of the screen that has the avatar is able to be manipulated because otherwise it can get very messy. Do they ever pick up each other's names or avatars by accident, move them around? Um, yeah, but that's never, that's sort of like, I guess, not a really big problem because if they're still in there, they can move it back. I've never seen a fight break out over it, though, thankfully. <laughs> I did see a fight break out over one of these documents where I had grade six students discussing tsunamis and one student said, oh, I'd run away. And one other student that knew a lot about tsunamis just thought that was really ridiculous and basically tore them apart and, you know, mentioned how fast exactly the tsunami was going and how fast humans run. And <laughs> it's quite funny. Any other um, suggestions or opinions about that? Um, all right. Well, I think that's, I mean, just we have... KWHL left, I think. Sure, go ahead. And, and jig, jigsaw groups, I mean, the application for jigsaw groups online is, is I think, fairly straightforward. You would have, um, so just to remind people, jigsaw group is where you have basically, the students start out in a group of students. Um, that's called their home group. You, as a teacher, have divided whatever content needs to be taught into the equal amount of groups that there are, and each group must have an equal amount of participants. Don't worry, there's links available if you want to brush up on this. Um, but basically, people move from their home group into expert groups, which contains one member of each of the home groups. They discuss and come to an understanding together, whether it be because they've read a page of a textbook or um, they've got some other kind of learning material. It's then their responsibility to, to return to their home group and teach that content to their home group. And basically the, the way that you assess understanding after that is by asking um, another student who didn't have that question as their expert group to describe it. And if they can, then um, the process has worked. Um, the best way to do that, I think, in in an online setting was be to, to be to use breakout rooms, to be honest. You'd have home expert groups and, and breakout expert rooms as well. So. Um, and then we had KWHL, which stands for um, the exact wording. Hold on. Bear with me here. 
you for a moment. Um, well, I'll get into that what that means um, in a bit, but it's basically a series of um, of checking of comprehension checking questions before um, introducing a new topic. So I would recommend that same maybe that same kind of Google form um, to reflect on their learning either before or after the session or the content's been taught, um, and then you can basically or use Padlet to basically check what people understand and know and want to know and uh, all about that, about the topics. So that's, that would basically be my, my suggestion for that one. So yeah, this is commonly, it's common in uh, PBL in project based or problem based learning, uh, where you can start off by looking at a situation or problem and people share and discuss what they know already. That's the first K. And then after that, looking at kind of the gaps in knowledge of what they want to know and then moving on to the H, okay, how are we going to find out? And I can't, can't remember what the last L was, but usually then later, for example, people do their research, they come back and they do their sharing in problem-based learning. So that was the first thing that I thought of when I saw that on the graphic. You're muted, Kendall. I saw your mouth moving though. Uh, the last the last L stands for what have we learned, so it's more of a plenary yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. So I guess those are the eight main um, the eight main things uh, adapted as possible for um, the online environment. Uh, in some of our earlier learning together sessions, we were playing around with Miro which is from the Spanish painter. And uh, the, it has a, several templates for interaction. It's kind of interesting. Unfortunately, it's not, I, I found that, well, it needs money, you know, I, I think. I mean, there's a free version, but it's very small, pre, uh, free, and then the MIAM is really big. So, um, but anyhow, the concept is interesting because it has a lot of templates for interaction. Uh, and one of them is the KDLHL. And uh, it, it, when we've tried it in our learning together groups, um, people, it just attracts interaction. So it, it's kind of like a magnet, you know, it just uh, pulls those metal filings towards it. Um, it's, it's, people seem to really like it. So you might want to check it out. But it, it has, you, you, you can set up, um, it's just ways of, it's kind of like mind mapping, but it has templates for mind mapping or collaboration so um yeah have a look uh and, and actually you could go to learningtogether.net and you could search for miro and you find some of the sessions that we uh or i can put them in the in the archive at learningtogether.net um i can add those to the archive i'll find them and, and do that graham stanley was uh, he introduced this to us uh, uh, just a quick question for Vance, Steve, and Kendall, and everyone else. Um, would you like to go into breakout rooms and to then focus on one of these? We can set up breakout rooms, for example, for the different types of eight activities. And then you can choose which breakout room you go into and talk with other people, share your experiences, um, and focus on that topic. Okay. It sounds okay. good. Great. And so, Vant, are you able to set that up as host? Okay, we'll give you a couple of minutes. Vant, you're muted. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, got, I got a nice message there, an alert, <laughs> an unmute alert. Okay, I was saying yes. I'm happy to do that, but uh, you'd have to. If I start setting, if I, you want me to create, create eight rooms, and that's a good idea. And let me just do that now. While uh, let's see, breakout rooms. Okay, I'm going to create eight breakout rooms. You can sort of remind me of what the rooms are. Here we go. Eight breakout rooms are being set up, and we're going yes. to let participants choose a room. Mm -hmm. And um, I just have to name the room. So room number one is um, four corners. Four corners. Okay. And room number two. 
What's this inside called? outside. Inside outside. The sushi. Inside outside. Okay. And room three. Jigsaw groups. Jigsaw groups. Jigsaw groups. And room four. Um, entry exit tickets. Entry exit tickets. Okay. Room five. Five is uh, Jeopardy, or what is the question? What is the question? Okay, oh, here we go. Uh, what is the question? Okay, or Jeopardy. Is chain notes. Sorry, what was number six? Chain notes. Team notes. Chain. Chain notes, chain notes, yes. Okay. And uh, seven is learning stations. Learning stations. Okay. And number eight is KWHL. Uh huh. KWHL. Okay. There we go. So uh, all the rooms are being opened. Okay. And so you should have an option to, you can head into a breakout room. You can see who is in a breakout, uh, you can see the number of people in breakout rooms and so on. Okay. Um, I didn't see where I was prompted to set a time on it, but. Uh, so, should we say 10 minutes? Yeah. Give enough room to say hello and then share some and then you'll get a, um, a one minute warning before it gets closed to return back. And we've talked about doing this earlier, and my job is to stay here and uh, make sure there's something going on in the text chat. So uh, there's something going on in the webinar on the on the Facebook feed and all that. So but, but do encourage you to go to other rooms. And uh, Rolly, up to you. We thought we could talk. Uh, Phil could go off to d different rooms, but that was uh, – Phil, Phil's going to pop in and out. Is that still operable? Yeah, I'm just going to take question. Yes. I may have a question. Like, can I can I move freely from one uh, room to another one, or do I have to stay in one for the rest um, of the session? So you should be able to move freely. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. on if you're on a uh, on a computer, then you should yes, find the, uh, you'll see the drop down menu, and on yeah. the right side where you see the blue numbers, that tells you how many people are in the room. You have okay. to hover over the blue number, and then the word join will appear. All right. Thank you. That room. I will if do that. Yeah. Okay. And then so it says that, move uh, to. Yeah. This, and you'll be able to see that uh, Pepti is, is in four corners already. Mm -hmm. If you're on tablet or on a mobile phone, it's actually a little bit easier. I think you can just tap on it and then scroll down to join, and you just go in. Okay. Thank you. You're so welcome. See you. See you there. <laughs> okay. Okay, so it's nine ten according to my very accurate computer clock. So at nine twenty, uh, I'll close the rooms, and you should get a if it doesn't time out automatically, mm -hmm. and uh, you should then get a message that you have one minute to close your conversation. So far, only one person has gone to the rooms. You know, another way to do this, by the way, if you're doing this in Zoom, is you let the computer put everybody in the different rooms. Um, you can also manually assign people. Uh -huh. You can also, it's optional to let people come back if they don't like the room. So you can imprison them there if you want for 10 minutes with each other. <laughs> so it could be like a sort of like a dunce corner. Yeah. We're going to go to the one in the room. Uh, Sylvia's in a room by herself at the moment, so somebody jump in there if you would like to. Yeah. Uh, Sylvia's there. I, I don't know. I don't see Sylvia. Why, because I'm... In the... Oh, yeah. We've got Michael popping into that room. Oh, I see. I, oh, I see. I've got to open up the... Oh, I can only do one at a time. So, okay. Sylvia and Michael are in... What is the question? Jeopardy? which I misspelled. I put an extra A in there. Uh, let's see. 
And I don't see anybody else. Phil is in KWHL. By himself, by the look of it. Yeah, three people have participated. Um, yeah, it's probably something that for effect should be done earlier in the evening, kind of like, uh, like, like you said, dance, dancing, you know, start the dancing at the end of the party. But mm -hmm. still, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Break rooms have uh, good functions. I mean, what, what do you, do you like to be put, uh, do you like to, uh, actually, I, I like to have the opportunity to select where I go. I, um, I just don't personally warm up to break out rooms. Um, but sometimes when I go there, I am quite interested in what's going on in the rooms. Sure. I mean, you get something different from smaller mm -hmm. discussions than bigger ones, right? Mm. Yeah, you do. And especially if you have a chance to come back and, and consolidate, as it said in that SOFLA uh, wheel, we have time to come back and talk about what went on in the rooms. Sure. Looks like we've got two uh, of the rooms going on. We've got the Four Corners room and the What is the Question Jeopardy in full swing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So they are going to break a room. <laughs> you choose. You choose a room. Where are if, they? <laughs> okay. Uh, how do? You, let's see. You're so everyone on a, can choose. Yes, you choose a room, and I think there'd be something on the bottom of your screen that. Uh, it says breakout room. Yeah, it says Second breakout room. The right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you see it there? Mini is from China. No. <laughs> Oh, I didn't see anything. So and, down at the... Uh, oh. oh, let's see. Down at the I'm bottom using my screen. iPad. Ah, oh, iPad. Hmm. I'm on iPad, yeah. Uh, Phil Maybe said... No, you, right. <laughs> yeah, he said you just touch something and then you what, wave his hand like that. And for me, that's... I'm just kind of wired for PCs. I started out on the DOS command line. I used to write batch files for starting DOS computers. So I don't know. I just uh, when GUI came along, it, well, I mean, I've gone with it now. But uh, every uh, new iteration uh, gets loses me behind in a little bit in uh, in intuitiveness. So. Um, so so Camilla's Camilla is also having some problems seeing it. I guess um, me, we don't know how it's looking. Um, the view, have yeah. you looked, do you have, can you see the view section? Mm. Up the top right, do you have a top right hand um, section? View, there? speaker view, I have that yeah. option. What about gallery view? I so have the gallery view, but I don't have then, the option to get into break of rooms either. What does it have anything at the bottom of your screen there when you the go bottom, to the gallery view? Um, Would you like me to manually assign you to a room? Gallery view. That would be good. Who, who, because who I don't have the option and I didn't receive the invitation either. Is that Tatiana? No, I wasn't talking. Oh, about, okay. But I, I can't get anywhere. Okay, well, if uh, uh, if you want me, okay, so let's see, the people who are not in rooms are Jackie. Do you want me to put you in a room? Camelia? Yes, uh, just yes. to let you know, if you are on a, if you're on a mobile device or like a tablet, if you tap your screen, then a little breakout room icon will show. Then you can tap that icon and that will give you a menu. If you're on a computer, then... Um, I think you need to go down to your bottom of your Zoom screen and where you have your kind of your um, toolbar menu and you should have a breakout room option in that toolbar. So you may need to click once as well to reveal it. You, you could look in the more, the more ellipses. Yes, that's that the That might be it. You know, we tested this, yeah. uh, Phil and I. We set up different computers, so we had four of us in the in the room. We found out as co-hosts, we couldn't really go there. But um, uh, on our other computers, we, we went in and out of the rooms. So I don't remember how we did it. 
<laughs> uh, Camelia, can you type which room you would like to be in and maybe, um, well, there's only, I think, two going on anyway. So right now there's, oh, just the what's the question, Jeopardy, maybe. Can you add Camelia to that manually? Okay. Camelia goes to what is the question? Jeopardy. Okay, there she goes. Anybody else? So they're... Uh, yeah, I would like to go somewhere, but okay. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> okay, uh, who is that? Give me your name. Tatiana. Tatiana. Okay, Tatiana. Which room? Four corners I, inside? Yeah. Four corners. Okay. Or four I don't corners. Know. I don't know if there's anyone in there, though. I don't think so, but... Or, or the other one. The one with people in it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Off you go. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm about to put myself there. Okay. Tatiana <laughs> assigned to... Oh, okay. Assigned to uh, what? Uh, what is the question? Okay, there you go. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Have a nice time. <laughs> Anybody else? So maybe if I use my uh, laptop or computer, uh -huh. it could you, work. <laughs> well, do you want? Do you I'm want using to, my iPad. Do you want me to send you to the the? Uh, Oh, all, you've got 58 seconds. Let me just send you there, Minnie, so that uh, if I can. Okay, oh, no, no, it's okay. I've lost, I've lost the option. Okay, there, it did time out in 10 minutes. And uh, <laughs> it's all, it's going to close all the rooms automatically in 45 seconds. And we could try this at Learning Together uh, in our WebHeads uh, meeting. We could. Camelia, sure. there'll be the information about um, the Jeopardy questions on um, Vance's um, website, the Learning Together site. The wiki. So mm -hmm. it's a shame you missed that, but you'll get the opportunity to see that information at least typed. So, What information? Um, Camellia's just said that she was offline for a while, so she has no idea about the Jeopardy question. And then I think you tried ah. to put her in the room, but for whatever reason, it didn't work. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's still, she's still well, in there. Let me just do a screenshot here and see what... Uh, well, I've got the opportunity. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, so you know, at least I'll make a screenshot of. So everyone is back now. Yeah, in my screenshot, I've got people in the rooms still. Okay. Question from Sylvia in our breakout, which Phil was just kind of in the process of answering, but I think it was quite interesting oh. about what rights to grant to the students within a Zoom session generally and breakout in. In particular, that. Uh -huh. And what what was the uh, upshot? This is the, the post breakout yeah. room. We have to talk about what we did. Yes. Yeah, so Sylvia's question was uh, and came with the point that you know sometimes you if you allow your students to annotate on the board or on your screen, then all mayhem can break loose, <laughs> which which I've had in my classes too. And I've I've observed classes and where you know teachers like who's wrote that <laughs> and so on. Um, so, joking aside, and, and so the, there is a learning curve, and basically with my seven to nine-year-olds, for example, then there are times where I allow them, and there are times where I basically turn off the ability for them to annotate. And so in, in the security settings, there's that shield down the bottom when you're the host. You can basically do things like enable waiting room, enable chat. Um, so I also have to disable their chat because I noticed when they were in somebody else's class, and I suspected it in my class, but I noticed that my own kids would be like chatting to their friends and having these side conversations, not paying attention to what's going on. So I thought, hmm, that's where I can see them like, you know, distracted and not paying attention. So I turned off the chat for them um, in my classes, except when I asked them and I want them to respond. I'm happy I'm not the only one. Okay, thank you, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the feeling, right? Often we think, am I the only one that has this thing? But, um, and it's really good to share and find out that we're not. Um, but yeah, the things like renaming themselves, I always let them do it at the beginning. They have fun with that. And then um, afterwards, you can always then turn it off. So you can say, like, oh, you have 60 seconds to choose your own name and you know they sometimes they do like superhero names or whatever else it's great pop stars list last week virtual backgrounds as well yes of... 
Um, yeah, so personally, I think, you know, I mean, kind of use, it depends, I think, I think, a lot on your own teaching style and where your comfort zone. I don't think there's a kind of necessarily wrong or right way to do things. Um, mm. And sometimes it's a bit of experimentation to what suits you and what suits your learners. Um, they will get used to it. Depends on their age group very much too. Obviously, yeah. my older students, I don't worry about them writing on my board in the class randomly. You know, I think that younger learners certainly need that synchronous component much more than the older ones, in my experience. Yeah. And you hoping... probably... No, uh -huh. I'm, I'm sorry. You probably don't have the free um, uh, Zoom uh, where it's limited for 30 minutes or 40 plus, right? You got the extended, the upgraded version, correct? We, we because I'm, li I'm limited by time. What's that? We used uh, the Google product, so this is actually one of my first times using Zoom ever. So, <laughs> uh -huh. because I feel pressed, uh, pressured for the time. You know, you got like a time uh, clock ticking. Um, you want to explain them, you want to organize them, uh, you want to um, be very interactive and play some games and all of a sudden like you got this uh, alert like 10 minutes left. <laughs> have, you, have you, do you, are you mandated to use Zoom? You have to use Zoom? No, I don't have to. I can use Teams, but I'm not very skillful in that. I found out that Zoom is very easy and kind of friendly mm, and the kids right. prefer that also. Yeah. Yeah, Teams is more for business and it doesn't feel as as nice as for learners like listening to students. Yeah. Um, Last I checked, Google Meet just didn't have the functionality either. It doesn't have, up until recently, I don't think it had breakout rooms. It, it does now, apparently, but um, you couldn't even basically mute others' microphones. So oh, really? you basically wow. have the same amount of rights as ever all of the students in the class. But mm -hmm. being a Google product, they do tend to, um, mm -hmm. it's never a finished thing. It's always changing and evolving. So, mm -hmm. yeah. My um, boss was pushing me to the uh, Microsoft Teams, but I refused, I guess I'm the black sheep <laughs> of the family. Yeah, but anyway, thank you. Yeah, just on, on time, uh, I actually, you know, with, um, I have the option, I can use a professional account and have unlimited time. Um, but with my younger learners, I'm very happy to have a 40 minute actually. And if they have a longer class, which they do, uh, they have actually, they have my 79 year olds, they have an hour, but having the 40 minutes is good because it forces a break, which I want to have with them anyway. And so basically the room opens halfway through, they get a break and they go off for five, 10 minutes and then come back. Yeah. Um, that works out so much better. Um, they need brain breaks in between, and obviously they need some movement. Some some kids are taking, um, our kids at international schools, they have their full curriculum, so they're doing like six classes on Zoom a day sometimes. Um, so, yeah, that was our experience too. Yeah. yeah. It's really important to factor that in. How many classes a day do you teach online? Me? Uh, uh, Phil, sorry. Oh, me, I don't have so many because I also do teacher training. And oh, I see, I see. So, so um, but, yeah, my some of my kids who I, who I tutor as well, then they are doing, like, basically from 8.30 till 3.30. Really? With uh, half an hour morning break and then 45 minute maybe lunch break. Oh, no. So, the, but, yeah, I think if, if they're in schools that manage it well the teachers are you know they're also doing some things actively it's not like they're sitting and just listening and learning um, mm -hmm. and it's not teacher wanted necessarily but there are some other classes that i've seen and it is very much still traditional teacher centered and it may as well have been recorded um so yeah it's a interesting yeah. Mm -hmm. thank you I was having trouble getting a word in edgewise, so I posted it in the text chat. But uh, Jitsi is one that people seem to like. I think I haven't used it myself. Uh, Big Blue Button is another one that uh, I think is, I'm not sure if it does breakout rooms, but anyway, there's a, I've just posted, there's an article that somebody named Austin wrote uh, that uh, 
suggest nine free alternatives to Zoom. And yeah. I have other, um, uh, just above that, there's uh, a document I've been maintaining, or I was maintaining when the emergency remote teaching era was on, and I was accumulating a lot of resources like this. So uh, anyway, have a look if, you, if you're looking for something other than Zoom. Yeah, I think Webroom looks quite attractive on the face of it, but I haven't really used it very much yet. Webroom? Um, do, do you have a link? It does do breakout rooms very effectively. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And it keeps a record of all the activity per breakout room and all the documents you've used. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of attractive features. Uh, mm -hmm. It's limited to 12 participants, though, I think. <laughs> which is small for most people's classes. Hmm. Okay. All right, so uh, any other comments? For, um, uh, four Corners or uh, activity stations, um, because you can, I, I think you can embed the, the activity within the breakout room. No need to have an extra link and such like. You're talking about with, uh, with what? With the Zoom? Or the, I, oh, web, you're, web. you're coming in and out, yeah. Oh, with web room. Sorry, I'm trying to get closer to the speaker. <laughs> yeah. Web room, yeah. Uh-huh, okay. Web room, okay, we'll, we'll look at it. Like that's we broom, it could be we broom. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, anyway, uh, we've been going for an hour and a half. I think that's uh, a lot of people have abandoned us already. We're, we're the, uh, the hardcore just sitting here. And I want to thank Kendall for doing such a great job on introducing us to these uh, eight uh, communicative, communicative, dynamic, kinetic ways of getting students interacting initially face to face, but uh, we're thinking about how to adapt these to online. Thank you. Minnie gives us a thumbs up. And uh, well, I, I also have we have a infographic version of the if you saw the original one, which was on screen where we've got one that's specifically for online learning. So we can mm -hmm. share that on on Vance's Yeah, put the send them to well. me or put the links in the text chat and I'll pick them up. Sure. It's even. I'm in Malaysia, so it's nighttime here. So it's in, near where Kendall is and where where uh, Phil is. But uh, anyway, so I'm not not doing anything until morning. But uh, when I wake up tomorrow, I'll spend time uh, putting together the the archive of this. Sure. Learn learning together dot net with a two learning two together. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming and. Uh, this has been Kendall Rowley in Hanoi and Phil Brown Hi. in Hi. Uh, Kuala Lumpur and me, Vance Stevens, in uh, uh, Penang, Malaysia. And I don't know, Michael, you, where are you? I'm in Greece at the moment. Greece. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Lucky you. <laughs> and where, where are you, Sylvia? Um, I'm in Slovakia. Slovakia. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And Mini in Nanjing, China. <laughs> ah, okay. And I, I did some interesting hiking in Slovakia. Uh, really? After, uh, oh, yeah. After the country is beautiful. It is beautiful, yeah. Uh, Starry Smolensk or something like that? Smokovets. 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 Yeah, it's in the high Tatras. Um, mm. Beautiful landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tatiana, where, where are you from? She's my co-worker. Ah, Hi, oh, I am from... I am from Slovakia too. Okay. <laughs> Anya was right. that one who talked to me into this. Yeah. yeah and I'm I... so glad. Thank you. Okay. Well, these are the videos I can see. I don't know if anybody else wants to say well, goodbye. Well, earlier to... I'm not sure is able to use audio, but um, she was um, texting earlier in the chat, so maybe she can um, post there where she's where she's located. And same with uh, Marcia and Rocio as well. Mm. <laughs> Be very. It's all very interesting. So, <laughs> okay. 
Well, anyway, uh, nice to talk to everybody. Hope to see you again. Uh, Likewise. This is Learning Together, episode 498. So when you go to learningtogether.net, you can find all 497 others. And what are you doing for number 500? Yeah, that's what party, I was going to ask. Party on November 29th. <laughs> that's the 500. Oh, 500 cool. breakout okay. rooms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one, one for each episode. Which episode do you want to go talk about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, no, that is buy it, the ultra zoom package for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's all the information is on the Learning Together Facebook group where we've been streaming this and uh, basically, uh, or I have a, 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 a wiki where I organize things, learningtogether.pbworks.com. So if you go to those places, um, I'll put them in the text chat before I disappear. So anyway, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to say goodbye to the Facebook room and uh, stop the streaming over there. Okay, bye, Facebook. And for this group, we got, um, let's see, uh, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, so bye, YouTube recording. Stop recording.